This is the poem Assisi by Norman McCaig and I'm going to start off by giving you a copy of the poem to uh, refer back to if you need it, just so that it's there. And let's get started. St Francis of Assisi is the patron saint of Italy and he was born in 1181, the son of a wealthy silk merchant. Young Francis didn't particularly enjoy that sort of materialistic wealthy lifestyle. One of the early stories about him tells that a beggar came and asked him for alms while he was on a stall selling his father's fabric. And as soon as Francis finished with his customer and completed his business deal, he ran after the beggar and gave him everything that was in his pockets. His father allegedly wasn't too pleased by that. And it wasn't the last time that they fell out over Francis's charitable doings. Another story tells that he was travelling and came to a place filled with birds and he asked his companions to wait while he preached to his sisters the birds. And the birds were apparently intrigued by his voice and didn't fly away and after that whenever he was depicted in carvings and engravings and paintings and whatever he was often painted with a bird sitting on his hand. He founded the Franciscan Order of Monks and it required them to observe the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ living in obedience without anything of our own and in chastity. So the idea was that they were um, living in complete poverty, that they had no possessions. Another really interesting fact which becomes relevant when we start to look at the poem is that St Francis suffered from a condition called trachoma, and he sought treatment in several cities before he died in 1226. Now quite quickly, only two years after his death, he was made a saint by Pope Gregory IX. And the day after making St Francis a saint, he laid the foundation stone of the basilica in the town of Assisi. And St Francis was initially buried there, but his remains were later hidden because they had a bad case of Saracen invaders and they were worried that the grave would be looted. He wasn't rediscovered until quite a long time later and is apparently now in the crypt, which is the lowest tier of the church. And the church is quite a complicated building. Now... An overview of the poem, we're looking at three stanzas of free verse, so we're not particularly looking for a rhyme scheme or a noticeable metre. It was inspired by a real-life experience. Norman McCaig had been to Assisi and had had a guided tour of the Basilica, the church. It's a first-person account, but it focuses on the beggar who sits outside the church, ignored by the priest and the tourists. And I think you quickly see that McCaig's anger gives this poem its strength as a comment on religious hypocrisy. So, if we start at the beginning. The dwarf with his hands on backwards sat slumped like a half-filled sack. The poet starts to build the image of the beggar looking like an old-fashioned toy and it suggests that he's badly made. The idea of his hands being on backwards, that his maker made an error when putting his hands on. And this, along with his small size, probably encourages people to stare at him and laugh at him and immediately lacks empathy for his suffering. Another suggestion is that his hands are permanently bent upwards as though in a, in a begging type gesture. The simile describing him as being like a half-filled sack suggests again that he is unfinished, but by explicitly comparing him to a thing that would be shapeless and kind of rough in quality, it just further dehumanises him. And the word slumped, the choice of verb, suggests that he can't sit any straighter making him sound both physically weak and a bit defeated. And then you get this sibilance, all these S sounds in the second line, sat, slumped, half-filled, sack. And that sibilance foreshadows the idea of sawdust running out of him, which is coming in the next couple of lines, and it's sort of the hiss of something that's deflating. And the next couple of lines, when we get to them, on tiny twisted legs from which sawdust might run. Tiny reiterates the dwarf's size, that he is small, but the alliteration of tiny and twisted emphasises his deformity and the suggestion is that he probably can't walk. Now this idea that sawdust might run from his legs 
In the early 20th century, toys were often stuffed with sawdust, like this little old bear in the photograph. To the best of my knowledge, that belonged to my grandmother. And if you squeeze it, you can hear a sort of squeaky, crunchy sound that is the sawdust it is stuffed with. So this was set up by the previous lines with the half filled and the sibilance that suggests something leaking. So again, it continues to compare him to a toy and dehumanise him, and again it suggests that he is badly made. But the idea that his stuffing is leaking out also suggests that his situation is getting worse. He's clearly in desperate need of help. And the sawdust might run, but ironically, it's the only thing that can, the beggar can't. Outside the three tiers of churches built in honour of Saint Francis. And just while you're watching that very complicated church drawing itself again, he shifts our attention to the church from the beggar, and the church is built in three layers. There's the upper church, the lower church, and then there's the crypt where Saint Francis is interred. The word choice of tiered makes it sound as though it's a wedding cake. It's indulgent and it's elaborately decorated. I know my initial silhouette at the beginning of this video is very dark, but the church isn't actually. It is very lightly coloured and, and looks sort of elaborate and pale and pretty like a, like a wedding cake. The beggar is outside and that is both literal and figurative. He is literally outside, but he is figuratively outside because he's excluded. And the size and beauty of the church contrasts with the small disabled beggar who sits outside. And there is real irony and the beginning of real anger in the fact that this church was built to honour a man who chose to have no belongings and devoted his life to serving others. That idea that they had no possessions at all of their own, and he spent his life serving the poor. McCaig highlights the betrayal of the saint's values, and we really start to see this, this long anger building. The enjambment St. Francis' brother... He is a brother because friars are brothers, that's what it means, but he's brother of the poor. And the enjambment takes us into this idea. He's a brother as in a friar, but he also sees himself as the friend and brother of the poor. And that parenthesis, brother of the poor, talker with birds, gives us the things that he was famous for, underlining the irony that this man is outside his church, not being looked after. It seems that the beggar has one thing that St Francis does not, and that's that he is alive, over whom he had the advantage of not being dead yet. The word yet highlights that he may not be alive for long, and it really isn't much of a life when the best thing you can say about it is that you're not dead yet. Is there also irony in the fact that the honours were heaped on St Francis after his death? Yes, I'm sure there is. And this whole stanza so far has been one sentence. And that for me starts to contribute to this impression of anger. The real sense that the speaker is too angry to draw breath. So we move into stanza two and the priest explained how clever it was of Giotto. Now Giotto was an artist from Florence who might have painted the frescoes in the basilica, although it's not entirely certain. And the significance of a fresco is that it's a particular painting technique involving painting on wet, freshly applied plaster. So that as the plaster dries, the paint fuses into the plaster. And it means that a lot of the artwork of the frescoes in the basilica has survived for a very long time. The priest is clearly acting as a tour guide, not as a man of God. And he is showing these tourists around and boasting about the frescoes which are essentially a material possession of the church, contributing to its wealth. When he uses the word clever, it has connotations of trickery, but it is also rather patronising. He's talking down to his audience, saying how clever the artist was, as though he's talking to children. And you sense the speaker's anger directed at this priest, because he's busy talking about the paintings, showing no compassion whatsoever for the beggar. 
And how clever it was of Giotto to make his frescoes tell stories that would reveal to the illiterate the goodness, and it carries on the goodness of God, obviously. Tell stories, again, sounds as though he's talking to children. And revealing the goodness of God suggests that something amazing is going to happen, and we sort of get the impression that the priest is some kind of a showman. I find the way that he talks about the illiterate. The illiterate would be most of the population in the 12th century, but he doesn't even use it as an adjective. He uses it as an epithet, and it names these crowds of people who were Giotto's audience, the illiterate. So it's quite, quite patronising, and you get the feeling again that McKeg isn't terribly keen on this priest. And the goodness is left at the end of the line, and we can imagine the priest pausing for emphasis. But perhaps in this pause are we invited to question how good this God that this priest serves is, if he allows this beggar to suffer the way he does, if he makes a man who is suffering the way this beggar is suffering, and his servant, God's servant, does nothing to help. So we get the goodness of God and the suffering of his son. And the alliteration, the goodness of God, the suffering of his son, sounds quite glib. They're almost like advertising slogans. Bit cheesy feeling. And it's hard to miss the irony and the anger behind the words. Because the suffering of the beggar needs no artist to reveal it. It's in front of the priest's eyes and he chooses not to see it. So you get the feeling that perhaps Giotto's clever frescoes haven't taught anyone anything at all, actually. I understood the explanation and the cleverness. It's the shortest sentence in the poem. It's really to the point, very pithy. And it's the only sentence that uses the personal pronoun I. It's the only point where he sort of breaks the fourth wall and speaks directly to the audience. And the speaker is cynical. He's understood more than the priest intended him to understand. The idea of giving pictures to people who can't read is, is not really clever. It's very, very simple. It's what we do in every picture book for toddlers. So the cleverness is almost sarcastic. The priest is flattering Giotto in a form of boasting about the church's material wealth, which is really at odds with St Francis's ideals. A rush of tourists clucking contentedly fluttered after him as he scattered the grain of the word. This moves us into stanza three, and the contempt of the speaker now turns on the tourists. Clucking contentedly and fluttered, caricatures them as, as chickens, gobbling up whatever the priest is dishing out, and contentedly suggests that they're happy and that the sight of the beggar hasn't bothered them. Clucking sounds a bit like clicking, something else that tourists do quite a lot, taking photographs. Taking photos, if they include the beggar, feels like a really insensitive, inappropriate thing to be doing. And here McKay uses this metaphor of scattering the grain of the word, which is an allusion to Jesus' parable of the sower. And in the parable of the sower, there's seed thrown by a farmer which lands in different situations, on good soil, on poor soil, on rocky ground and where it's taken by birds. And only one of them, in Jesus' story, yields a crop. And it's interesting that in that parable, as Jesus tells it, seed that is taken by birds does not grow. Because it's a metaphor about the word of God and the idea of it growing is of it being believed and acted on. It's quite fitting that the one that, where the birds take it in Jesus' story produces no crop. There is no sort of belief and spiritual growth. It was they who had passed the ruined temple outside. The sentence structure that puts the emphasis on the word they, and it puts the blame on the tourists for the selfish way that they've passed the beggar and disregarded him. And then the metaphor of the ruined temple is referring to the beggar, and it reminds us of the miserable condition of his body with the word ruined. But it also alludes to the biblical idea that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit.
and you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. But as well as contrasting the ruined temple with the grand ornate church, and given McCaig's obvious anger at the church and its representatives, it also seems to suggest that the church itself has been ruined by materialism and selfishness. So we get the ruined temple outside, whose eyes wept pus, whose back was higher than his head. So the focus has returned to the beggar, and the speaker continues to list his deformities and his sufferings. Now, it's hard not to be slightly disgusted by the idea that his eyes weep pus. And I think McCaig does it deliberately to point out to us that we are probably no better than the tourists. We want to judge them and we want to be angry at them, but we have all probably walked past homeless people who needed our help. And McCaig is quite careful here to make the point that we shouldn't think ourselves any better. The shortest sentence in the Bible is that Jesus wept. And I think in the context of a poem that's about religious hypocrisy and, and religious truth, that's quite important. And it comes when Jesus has been told that his friend Lazarus has died. Lazarus um, was later raised from the dead, but Jesus still wept. And it's a sign of human empathy and grief and compassion. And somebody could do with weeping for this poor beggar, but nobody does. And it's also significant that St Francis suffered from trachoma. I mentioned that in the introduction. It's a bacterial disease of the eyes. So actually, St Francis's eyes probably wept pus. He had trachoma when he died. So McCaig begins to draw this poem to a close by starting to draw these links between the beggar and the saint, which makes it even more heinous that the beggar is ignored by the priest and the tourists. And we get the fact that his eyes wept pus, his back is higher than his head, and his lopsided mouth. And we're almost expecting him to say something else that, that makes us feel this sort of visceral pity, but it isn't. The way he concludes this triplet isn't shocking or hideous, it's innocent and gentle and totally changes our impression of the beggar. That he says grazie in a voice as sweet as a child's when she speaks to her mother. Grazie means thank you, and this poor man has nothing to be grateful for, but he's polite and thankful anyway, and we see a hidden beauty in him that the priest and the tourist never see and McKay continues to build it with this final line, or a bird's, when it spoke to St Francis. Here, the link with St Francis is strengthened again by reminding us of the birds that he was famous for talking to. The message that the saint would have cared for the man, and that by ignoring him, the priest is failing to live up to St Francis's example, could not be stronger.